Welcome to the Siegel Design Institute speaker series. This is our first talk of the winter term. And first of all, quick, quick poll of opinion. What do you think about the space room? Do you like it? Okay, I think it's, I think it's kind of fun. It's a little different. Um, I've challenged, just so you know publicly, I'll make the challenge known. I've, I've challenged Cindy Tripp, our speaker, to use the drill press somehow in her, in her talk. So that's, look out for that in the talk. We'll help her if she, if she has a hard time integrating it. So first of all, I'm honored to have Cindy Tripp here. She has been, I think what they call it, PNG a lifer, is that what you, what you use? Oh, I hate she to think of it that way. 1988, joined Procter & Gamble, and she's worked on brands near and dear to my heart, and perhaps to yours as well. Charmin brand, Puffs and Pampers, all things this time of year I, I enjoy quite a bit. Um, in 2005, she was called the media maven by advertising age, and that same year was actually a, a turning point in my mind. It, it's because it was when I became very interested in what Procter & Gamble was uh, doing at that time. She started working with uh, Claudia Kopta at that time, who was the VP of design, and trying to integrate design as an uh, organizational ca uh, capacity at, the, um, at Procter & Gamble. And what's particularly interesting about Cindy is her ability to... There's seats up here, so come on up. Come on up. Her ability to broker design into an organization that has 140,000 people in it. And that was very, um, that approached problems in a very different way. And what Cindy and Claudia realized was the opportunity to use design as a way of approaching problems in a very different way than, um, than P&G had done historically in their 170 year history, is that right? Mm -hmm. So if you are curious about who is behind the major organizational change initiative in terms of integrating design at Procter & Gamble, this is the woman right here. We have her as our honored guest right here. And she is, she's honestly changing the way that Procter & Gamble works, which is not a small feat. So she's going to share wonderful insights and stories as to how this actually works outside of academia, which I think we all need to hear, and what it is really like to introduce, introduce design into, into the world. So without further ado, I'm honored to um, have met uh, Cindy a couple of years ago, and she will be telling us about her experience at Procter & Gamble. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming and joining me on this uh, afternoon. I'm thrilled to be here. It's uh, a great honor, actually. So um, I've respected uh, the Northwestern University for a long time. And um, we have a lot of talented people at P&G that have come from various schools at Northwestern. So it propels P&G's business results forward, which I appreciate as a stockholder. And uh, just being around people today and hearing uh, their ideas and what some of the students are doing is inspiring. And everyone needs a little connection to academia every now and then just to get a, uh, another rush of uh, energy. So thanks for giving that to me today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I have been a lifer at PNG. I didn't intend to be a lifer at PNG. I intended to be there two years, five years tops. But um, what I've found is that every time I've gotten dissatisfied, uh, Two, one of two things has happened. Either P&G changed or a really cool new opportunity opened up that I got to take on, which I loved. So just by accident, you wake up and 22 years later, there you are. But I've had about, um, I would say, five very different careers at P&G. Um, currently, I'm embedded in the design organization, though I'm trained as a marketing um, person and spent most of my career in marketing. So. Um, that's awfully fun too. So as a little advertising for P&G, you can have seven or eight careers at P&G in a lifetime and never get bored. So, you know, that's kind of fun. Um, I am here because Liz Gerber asked me to be. Um, Liz, as you may or may not know, was part of the team that helped P&G launch our design thinking effort inside the company. And she was amazing with our team and really role modeling what it looked like to, to work in a way that was open and collaborative and pulling out the best in people. And so she stood out amongst the people that we worked with. And so um, one of the things when we came back from that session, uh, Tiffany, who was my colleague at the time, and I were like, we gotta stay in touch with her because <laughs> she's amazing. And then when she moved to Northwestern, we're like, yay, she's closer to Cincinnati. So when Liz and I started talking about what she's been researching and what I've been doing and practicing in the business, um, we just have a lot of um, common challenges that we're curious about and that we're studying together. And then she said, come talk to us and come spend the day at Northwestern. And so I'm here um, 
really out of great gratitude and admiration for Liz Gerber and glad to be with you all because maybe there's something that we're learning in this very large company called P&G that may be useful to you or at least inspiring. So that's why I'm here. Um, we went on a journey in design thinking that took a long time to get started but has picked up momentum in the last several years. Um, it really started with Ernest when A.G. Lafley, our then CEO of the company, decided to establish a design function at P&G. So previously, there wasn't a design function. There was marketing and products research and research and development. Um, there were a lot of different functions, but design didn't exist separate. And so back in 2001, AG decided to appoint a vice president of design and to establish a design function. And so that was really the green light to get going. Get going on what exactly? We didn't know. He just knew that there was something about design that he thought would be useful to the company. And as AG has gone on to say to me, his understanding of design at that point was very simplistic and more driven by aesthetic and form and function, more the application of design to more tangible things. But over time, he saw that the mindsets and methods that designers use to solve problems were applicable to the business problems he was facing in his organization at the top of PMG. And so his definition broadened over time as he got more familiar. But it really started with just an inkling um, and just a thought that there could be something here. And so he hired Claudia to start this design department. And from 2001 and 2005, really what she went about doing was acquiring designers because we felt like we couldn't wait long enough um, for the designers to be promoted through the P&G system because we're a promote within company. If you want to create a major shift, we needed more experienced designers more quickly. And so she really spent those first few years getting them embedded on businesses, hiring people from the outside with 10 to 15 years of experience and getting them acclimated to P&G, which is no small feat because when they work in a design shop of 20 people, 40 people, it's a very different environment than coming into a you know, 140,000 person company where there's lots of hierarchy and protocols and policies. You know, my husband runs an architectural firm. He's an architect and he's a partner. And they have 40 architects and they don't have all the procedural stuff that we have at P&G. And they don't want it, right? So, I mean, they do it very loose and it's very relational and it's very different. And so, um, so there's a culture shock coming into P&G when you're coming from a design firm. And so a lot of those first years were just kind of getting the, the soil tilled, if you will, so that the seeds could plant. And so that's really what the early years were. In 2005, Claudia hired Rotman School of Business at University of Toronto, Illinois Institute of Technology School of Design, and Stanford D School to consult with her on how can we get design embedded into the DNA of the company. And so David Kelly and Patrick Whitney and Roger Martin were the key leads that worked with Claudia on this question, what can we do? And um, they prototyped an experience, a design thinking problem solving session that Roger talks about in his most recent book on design thinking the next business competitive advantage. And it was in London for a hair, hair styling business. And um, I literally had just accepted the job offer and Claudia says, I need you to come in December to London for this thing because I need you to see it because I'm going to ask you to lead it. <laughs> I'm like, what? Um, and so I hadn't even really started on the job and I wound up at this thing called design thinking problem solving. And it was very different than the way we do it today. It was the first prototype. And actually, as I, Claudia and I like to celebrate, it was a failure, a huge flop, because while the experience was nice, nothing happened as a result of it. And my definition of success is that something actually happens, that you just don't have a good three or four days together, that actually you're changed in some way. So we had a very positive experience, and there were bright spots, but nothing at the end of the day took root. And so while everyone felt good about the time, we didn't see the kind of change we were expecting. And so we went back to school, and that's the point. I came on in, um, in earnest in early 2006, and we started um, working on how to really figure this out and turn it into something that was useful for P&G, taking the good stuff, learning from the bad stuff, and reconceptualizing. Um, so that was, that was the early time. And, and so we moved on, and we had several things we did, and we had you know, several missteps. February of 07, I had a complete flop of a workshop in pet care. Um, I really, really thought, that you could um, 
Well, let's just say the essence of design thinking, which we'll talk about, requires that people iterate and engage and create. And we just we didn't understand how important it was to fast cycle that stuff. And so we, we tried some things that ended up kind of diminishing that impact. And therefore, nothing happened. So I would call it a failed experiment. If you go ask the business leader, it was a positive experience, but it wasn't impactful. And so we've had a couple of those, but each of those turned into learnings that helped us get better along the way. And you can see that in, um, in, in May of 07, we went back to school, um, to Stanford, to the D School, and we did an executive education program with them. The idea all along when Claudia commissioned Roger, David, and Patrick, her idea all along was we want to be able to do this for ourselves. P&G is a big organization. There aren't enough agencies in the world to do what we need to get done in design thinking on a daily basis, to have design embedded in the DNA without us being able to do it multidisciplinary. And so when we hired them, we hired them to help us figure out how to do this for ourselves and to make it self-sustaining. And so the May um, event at Stanford where I met Liz had everything to do with kind of creating that momentum. And we trained 32 P&G people, um, all functions. It was volunteer. We sent out a note to people we knew that were kind of had a mindset for design thinking. And we said, we're going to go train people on how to work this way so they can help others work this way. If you want to come, we'd love to ha have you join us. And we got 32 passionate people who were the beginning of this uh, revolution of what's really taken hold. So it was just a couple of years ago that we really, in earnest, made a dramatic impact. And it's really the last couple of years that's been getting the attention of the media and that P&G keeps being talked about. It's what happened when we brought it in-house and really scaled it. So we're going to talk about that journey a little bit more now. So when we say design thinking, everyone has different language. So I just thought I would say what we tend to say it is. Um, you know, consumer inspiration, um, it's uh, abductive thinking, imagining what might be, imagining new future realities, not just being wed to past history, but also what might be true, um, and doing to think in a low-res prototyping way, and then iterating very rapidly, and using short cycle times. So that's a critical component of what we do. P&G people are like this drill bit. Here I go. It, all of this is working to optimize this little <laughs> tiny experience. In the grand scheme of things, this drill thing doesn't do a whole lot. I mean, it's useful for its narrow purpose, but in, as life goes, it's not that useful. It doesn't have a lot of agility. And P&G has a tendency to be narrow perfectionists, to have entire organizations really go after optimizing a single, single thing. And that is the challenge we face as PNGers, to not become so obsessed with optimizing the single thing that we miss the context around it. And so it's really the context of this environment, which has many ways for us to come and create things that you actually get meaning out of this room, not the drill machine. So that is, um, that is for us, um, the challenge. And at PNG, people will spend hours optimizing the drill bit when what they really need to think about is creating the overall environment, opening their eyes and looking around. Okay. So there we go. That was Liz's need, and now it's done. All right. Um, I mentioned that we worked with three organizations, but I have to say the D School at Stanford had a large impact on how we practice design thinking. We used their process of observe, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Um, but we informed it with a couple of the things that um, we didn't get from Stanford that weren't part of the original design as well. Um, we work with human potential theory, which looks at people as part of a matrix of uh, a matrix in relation to one another, and the human dynamics and the energy forces between people, and leveraging chaos theory to create human connection. So we work with a woman that has an organization called Matrix Works out in Boulder, Colorado, and she really has uh, been the practitioner that's helped us tap into that. And so she's enabled us to figure out how to create healthy human dynamics on teams so that the creative juices are flowing. And that's been a big part of how we practice design thinking, really tapping into are we in limbic resonance? Do we feel felt? Do we feel present? Are we listening to each other? Are we, are we getting what we need out of the session? And what are the things you can do to help make sure that that's taken care of so you can move forward? And so that's a big part of our practice, and we do a lot of training with her. 
And so she's been, she's been phenomenally helpful. Uh, the other um, thing that we work with is we work with an improvisational actress. And she works with us on play theory and games and how to use improvisational techniques to unleash the blockages we face when we're creating. And so it sounds very loosey-goosey. And I know, you know if you say play and games to people, they're like, ooh, ooh I don't do that. Um, but in reality, we do it all the time at PNG. We just don't tell them that's what we're doing. But we're trained by an improvisational actress. So that's great. Um, as we think about the journey, being a marketer, I can't help but keep going back to marketing models. And I was, I was sharing some earlier today with people I was talking with. When we started this journey, we really focused on innovators and early adopters. And we were focusing on people who naturally are curious about new things and want to try new things. I have found at PNG, and Claudia talks about this in Roger Martin's book, and um, you, know, you go where the suction is. If there are curious people out there who want to try something new, you go to them first. You don't force it down someone's throat who's not naturally open to it. So the first five years, it was really about working with the people that were open and interested. And then as we moved through, we said, OK, we have this group interested. Now let's create champions and capability within that, or that group and activate them. And that's when we started training internal facilitators and people that started volunteering their time for this work. And so that was 2007 to 2009. We are now facing the ugly chasm between early adopters and innovators and early majority. That's a huge difference. When you're talking to early adopters and innovators, something new, funky, different, uncomfortable, they're all over it. When you're talking to early majority, they want to feel safe. They want to feel that it's proven. They want to feel that, that this is acceptable behavior in the company. And the language you use to attract early adopters is exactly the language that puts off early majority and vice versa. So we're in this delicate balance now, right now, where we're trying to move to early majority while not losing our early adopters. <laughs> Go figure that. So it is a challenge. We have changed our language. We've changed the way we talk about it. We're using more mainstream language. So before, we were talking about fail early and fail often and using all this provocative language about prototyping and the, po the power of it. We still do the exact same process, but we talk, don't talk about failure quite as, you know, as openly. We talk more about ideating and creating many possibilities. It's slight shifts in the language. Um, and we're using things like business press to credential that design thinking is a valid capability in a business environment. And so we send those inf that information around. And when we're training people in this practice, it's harder for them. So we have a lot of early majority people that are starting to sign up to get trained to work in this way. The way we used to train it with the early majority, they just got it quickly. We have to work a little harder to unlock it, it the process for them, and help them see how they can fit in and build their confidence and comfort. So we actually have slowed down a little bit. The other thing we've done is we've said, it used to be if you signed up, you were in this network where you were expected to facilitate. Now we say, you've gone through the training. What is your passion? Is your passion to facilitate or your passion to support and endorse? And then we do a third day of the training where, with people who want to have this be more present in their lives, where we actually have talk about what does active support and engagement look like when you're not actually doing it versus doing it. And so we're recognizing some people are just curious and want to get more comfortable with it, and they want to be supportive, but they don't want to actually drink the Kool-Aid and become major advocates doing it all the time. So we're beginning to recognize some distinctions. But that's where we are right now. And at the same time, trying to figure out how not to turn off our, our innovators and keeping it fresh for them. Um, one of the things I, I want to just come back to, um, Martin, you said that uh, you know codifying it. I think it's very dangerous to codify design thinking too much. And, and I think I have codified it somewhat, but if it becomes too rigid, it actually loses its power. Because every time we do it, we do it very specifically for who's the user that we're solving for and what are the conditions. And that may lead you to an entirely different design experience right? for how you go about solving it. The, the issue we have is if you codify it too much, people rigidly go down it. We had that happen. Um, one of our newer facilitators, he's a designer, he did a session in Europe. And it was a session on strategy, and he approached it like a session on product development. And it was a flop. Luckily, the general manager of the business had been through a strategy session before and understood. He goes, 
he designed it for a product design session. It was interesting. He understood what the error was, um, but, the, but he had followed a formula too far. And so I think one of the things when you practice design thinking in business is that people want to codify it. They want to turn it into a process like every other process you use. And if you do that, you lose its power, its agility, its flexibility. So we work very hard to um, try to keep it fresh and allow people to change it. In fact, when we train people on how to work this way, we say, the first time you facilitate, change something up. Take a risk. Try something new. Um, because I think if you don't do that, you're not continually learning as a facilitator. You get kind of dead. So that's where we are. And that leads to um, the rhythm of design thinking that I think is critical. Um, I think people want it to be in control all the time and predictable. And Roger Martin talks about reliability versus, versus validity, a reliable, pr predictable process, which takes you to this control axis over here, right? In PNG, we like control. That's a very good axis for us. It's a comfort zone. And what we try to do in design thinking is, yes, there are times when you need to be a little more in control, but there's times when it needs to swing to this other axis of chaos because that's where creativity is born. And so that ebb and flow, to me, is a really important rhythm. So when I'm designing a session, I'm actively thinking about where will the people feel out of control, chaotic, and confused. I want to make sure those places are there because I want that creative tension to be part of the process. And it could be different places for different sessions, but I just, we, we actively look to not make it comfortable for folks. This is from a website, B plus design, uh, businessplusdesign.com, and this guy blogs a lot, and I love this because he talks about the design maturity continuum, moving from unconscious to style and aesthetics up to form function to problem solving to framing. And I would say that when AG and Claudia first conceptualized their idea on design and design in the DNA of the company, they were really focused on the first two levels, aesthetics and form function. But what we have found so powerful, and the reason it becomes so multidisciplinary, you know, where you start to get finance people excited and manufacturing engineers excited, is the fact that it can apply to a much broader array of problems. And so the problem solving and framing has been a place where this has enjoyed enormous growth in the company. We've used, I've personally been on sessions that, where we've looked at innovation strategy challenges, um, activity system, where to play, how to, how to win choices, using the monitor system, but using design thinking to come up with the options and alternatives and selection. So it's very powerful. We use it on female retention. Um, basically, we say, what's a problem that you're losing sleep about, and let's go try to solve it. And it can cross a range of different activities. This looks at some of the, um, some, some of the things we've done. Uh, we've done front end of innovation sessions, like white space. Um, we've done reframing the value equation of our brand. We did one on gross margin, how to, how to reframe gross margin. Um, E-commerce strategy, cross-category scale. Um, we've done, fem I mentioned female retention. And then we've done dosing of products and shopping environments. We've done all kinds of product sessions. And, and the more it's in the form, function, and style, the more it probably lives in a part of the organization more dedicated to that type of work. So that's when you get into R&D and products development and design kind of working in those spaces. Um, the higher order stuff tends to be much more multifunctional, multidisciplinary leadership team type activity. So the process is, as I said, we start with inspiration, observing and listening and getting ideas from people. Um, and really trying to define the real need. When you ask somebody what's your problem, they'll give you a problem that may even have a proposed solution in the problem definition. You know, I want to create a faster car um, when the real issue is speed of transportation. Um, so you just, you just have to really work to understand their need, and then you have to reframe it from the person that you're solving for's perspective. This was a woman we talked to in... Um, in uh, Kobe, Japan, and we, she was sharing her stories about her family, and it was just beautiful. She was a beautiful lady, had all kinds of interesting things to share. But at the end of the day, what we took away as her need was not that she needed, and this was for home care, she didn't need a better, more fragrant home care product. She didn't need a new and improved Swiffer. She needed, um, she was the seldom rewarded lone fighter mom who needs magic to help in the battle against chaos. She needed magic. She talked about how dry her life was, how 
routine it was and the things that were going on in her life. And she was kind of just in need of experience and, and joy. And um, so you say, okay, well, what in the heck does that have to do with Swiffer or with Febreze? Actually, it unlocked all kinds of ideas. So then we said, like, how do we make a better Febreze? We said, how do we give her more magic and joy in her life? We created these, um, you know, prototypes of products, which you can see sort of over here. Um, you know, uh, things that the kids could use in the bathtub that gets them dirty to get them clean. We, we created origami paper that's Febreze scented that her kid and she could do crafts together and then leave the house smelling fresh. I mean, we created, and you should have seen her reaction when she saw these ideas the next day when she came back. Some of them just touched her heart. She was like, she wanted them. And in Japan, the Japanese culture, they like little cute things in their homes, kawaii things is what they call them. And so this was fitting into her culture. Now what happened as a result of this is they had, um, the business team had been really looking at innovation as faster smell, dissipation, better freight. You know, it had been very, um, going back to the needs, it had been very focused on the functional needs of the products. That wasn't what she needed. She was looking for more joy in her life. And so the products we came back with had great performance, but they also connected with her emotionally because they offered her a little levity and joy in the daily routine. And so that, that idea led to them changing an initiative they had planned to launch and to make it more fun. They made it more fun. They actually started legitimizing fun as a valid place for us to innovate for that woman and for people like her. I mean, that's exciting. That was an incredibly exciting day, uh, week. And um, anyway, but that was, that was getting to the real need, right? Her need. People don't go around saying, I need a dryer diaper. I mean, that's not what a mom really needs. She needs her baby to be healthy and to develop and to get what it needs. And so if that's the real need, it takes you to a different place. Um, how many people have seen this um, video? Not everyone. So I'm just going to play it because it's fun. We need a little fun. And um, I think you'll enjoy it. This is an example of taking something like how do you get people to walk stairs and be more healthy versus taking the escalator? Well, you have told, we've told people it's important to do that, and they don't do it. So you have to tap into what is really deep, you know, what is the deep, deep thing there. And here they tapped into making it rewarding, immediately rewarding to walk the stairs. And when we prototype at P&G, we don't prototype with this stuff. We prototype with uh, pipe cleaners and Play-Doh and paper. And this is a skit that they're working out right here. Um, this is our vice chair of the um, global fabric care business. And, um, and this is the head of innovation for the company. And 
this woman, she was amazing, Delane Hampton, one of our top researchers. Uh, she, so anyway, that, that is a group of people, a leadership team, that is working on a challenge. And they are prototyping through Skit. And they created this Skit to really get an empathy with our small brands in the company. Because we're oriented towards scale and larger brands. And our small brands struggle to get resources. So this was looking at a different activity system that could get them resources by becoming small brand ants. And they all have on antennae, as you can see, to get in character. Um, actually, that led to a lot of great action. It led to a reconciliation of our product portfolio and the business model we use for our small brands and what's in and off strategy. So it was a great exercise. Um, but we prototype through skits, sometimes by creating things. Um, but the idea is, how do we meet the need? And here's um, another session. We're prototyping some different things here. Here's an organizational redesign. Does it look like an organizational redesign? We were looking at, um, and, and actually here, AG, who was our CEO at the time, has this prototype that he's explaining to the employee who is having difficulty getting her work done because our organizational design doesn't work. And so he's explaining this to her and showing it and getting feedback. And she's agreeing with some things and not others. And, and then this particular woman leads our healthcare, actually leads the North American business now. And she is explaining her prototype to someone who's giving her feedback. And out of this came some principles that led to an organizational redesign that's been implemented in the company that is early signs going well. So um, you can use it for strategy. We were just strategy. We were showing organizational uh, redesigns and how, re how organizations would be in relation to one another. So getting at the silos, that's one of the issues. The issue was everyone was doing their separate thing, and you were missing the cross-category silos. And there's no incentives. There were no incentives to go beyond your business profit and loss center. And this was dealing with that, saying, come on, P&G should be able to capitalize on the fact that we have such a diverse portfolio and skills that can cross. It's part of what has spurred our growth, is taking fats in, and from candles and turning it into soap and, and cleaning agents, which then turned it into something else. And so you know, in the early days, that was happening. And so this was re-looking at, are we still designed right for the company of our size to make that happen? And so we've made some actions based upon that that are going to help us capitalize. Um, so I've shared some of these stories. This was the one that I just shared about how do we get better cross-category scale to market. And um, so you see that a bigger picture on that. Um, this was how can um, Allay help consumers find the right product for them at shelf. Um, Allay, as you know, has many boutiques, you may know, and it's difficult to navigate. And we don't control the shelf. So they have to walk in knowing. But we didn't know that until we did the design thinking session and realized we were focused on the shelf. And the consumers helped us understand, no, I'd rather walk in confident to know what to buy. And that led to a website that's been very successful in helping consumers get to the right product line. This was, um, we have a strategy that 50% of our innovation comes from outside the company. And we're a large company, and we're hard to get in the door. If any of you all have ever tried to do a cold call to sell business to P&G, you know it's hard to find out who to talk to. Um, this was a session in January where we were looking at new ways to do that for inventors and venture capitalists. So we actually ran a session where we co-created with them. And we did a session out at Stanford. Um, we led a session out there that had um, venture capitalists, uh, some of our innovators in the company, and um, external inventors, and looked at new activity systems that would allow us to plug and play together better. So that's uh, more to come on that. And then, you know, how can we enhance our fabric care strategic plans? Um, we did a session for fabric care where we did ethnographic research and prototyping and looked at the patterns that emerged and saw that there were two white spaces of important focus that the category didn't have on their strategy, two, and that were critical for long-term success. And um, so we, A, changed the strategy to adjust, to put the new stuff on, take old stuff off. Um, and then what happened was the experience was so um, authentic and real for the participants, the leadership team, that when they went back to their daily work, they had a much quicker, nimble ability to make assessments on new ideas. So the Super Bowl spot that happened in 08, a couple of years now, um, happened in a very quick time with no test market. 
It was a huge amount of money, and it was done on judgment because they had done this work together, and they had such empathy for their target consumer that they knew that this was the right thing to do on a way that they couldn't have known prior. And the GM of that business says, I totally made a call on judgment because of design thinking and how it opened me up to understand strategically what needed to happen on the business. Very exciting. Um, and then I mentioned the gross margin question. Um, our home care business in Europe was trying to figure out ways to um, grow gross margin going beyond the typical things that finance looks at. And they did a design thinking session on that. It sounds crazy to do a session on gross margin. It came out with lots of ideas that were unexpected. Some got implemented last year and contributed to the financial results that were excellent. And some are getting implemented this year. So what happened? We unleashed empathy. I mentioned that in the beginning, that inspiration, getting that inspiration with the user is so critical. And a lot of our people at P&G have experience with users. They've done a lot of in-home visits. They've done a lot of focus groups, quantitative research. So they actually have a lot of experience, but they've done it in a very um, expected way. If you think about kind of three concentric circles, we tend to go in with more the narrow perfectionist typically go in saying, let's talk about Swiffer. Let's talk about how to make Swiffer better. And that's very useful for optimizing the product experience. And so we shouldn't stop doing that. But there's another lens, one kind of standard deviation away, which is looking at the context around and saying, how does Swiffer fit into your life? What is your life con context that we have to fit into? And what are the opportunities there? And that's where magic shows up. And then there's another deviation away from that, which is macro trends, which we have typically done census things and things about population shifts and different macro trends. And we have been all over that, dem demographic shifts, et cetera, as a company. We just never got that lens in the middle. So what we try to do with design thinking is focus them on that middle rung and really create an inspiring experience that unlocks all their other research. So now that I've had this experience talking to the woman in Japan, and seeing her in that broader context, a lot of other research makes sense to me now. I'm like, oh, and I saw this, and I saw that. So it's not that we have to create, in our case at P&G, a comprehensive ethnographic piece of research to kick these sessions off. We typically don't. Now, if it's a new topic area, a team is newly formed, they don't have a lot of that base experience, then yes, we need to do that. But if it's an existing team that has a lot of experience, we need to unlock that experience. And so that's really what we've been focused on. And what happens when you do that is you unleash empathy for the user. And when you unleash that empathy, you start to care about actually making a difference. And that has been so powerful. In sessions, people say, but that won't solve it for you know, Jody. That won't solve it for Jody. I, you know, she said this, and we need to do this. And, and it's powerful to see these, these people in these sessions really caring about Jody or Joan or Bob. They, they care. And so they start to really put their heart and soul in it. And what's happened that's been really interesting to me is that um, when we unleash empathy in these design thinking sessions, it doesn't go back into a box after the session. So there's an interesting surprise. People get transformed like, oh my god, this was amazing. And they start to just see the world with more empathy, being more open to putting themselves in other shoes. And so you start to see other things changing. So it's not that design and design thinking have led personally all the changes that are happening around us, but they have planted the seeds that are now growing into plants that are starting to create other seeds. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the company. I'm going to show you a few things um, that are happening. First, our purpose statement. Um, the, ha the tagline is touching lives, improving lives. But the official full statement is provide branded products and services of superior quality and value that improve the lives of the world's consumers now and for generations to come. And the part in the italics, now and for generations to come, wasn't in our purpose statement eight years ago, nine years ago. It used to stop just, we'll improve the lives of the world's consumers, period. But as people started to have more empathy, they started to realize we have to not just solve it for this generation, but for the generations to follow. And so that started this, this whole thought process, which led to a language change. And the, you know, I remember Claudia pointing out that our, our statement of purpose was touching, but it wasn't, it wasn't where it needed to be. And she didn't change it. She didn't personally change it. But the whole experience that happened around it resulted in it getting changed. 
and we all think it's a lot better now. We also have brands that are beginning to reconceptualize. It's not about containing periods, if you're always. It's about empowering women. And if it's about empowering women, what should you be strategically doing beyond just the pad? And so here's an example of, of their answer to that. This is a very successful program that operates globally. In a small village in Africa lives 13-year-old Nia. For up to one week every month, Nia may have to miss school just because she has her period, which means she may fall so far behind, she'll eventually drop out. Now when you buy Always, you'll be helping to supply the girls of Southern Africa with an education and a pad that protects more women than any other brand. So no girl misses her chance to shine. Have a happy period. Always. So every pack of Always you buy in a developed world helps an African girl have pads so she can go to school. That came out of work that was done in our Eastern European organization. The marketing director was Uta Hagen. And she, spent, she and her team spent a lot of time in villages in Africa, really understanding why um, you know, first girls were not moving into disposable uh, menstrual products, and then secondly, the broader context of their lives. And that's where this came, was from being very intimately present and then figuring out what they could do um, on many levels. And so it's a very successful program. And in, and in the US, if you buy a package, part of the profits go to support that. This is a program that many people are aware of that Don does, that they've begun to commercialize more, which is helping wildlife through oil spills. Um, Don is gentle and yet effective on Greece. And so when you buy specially marked packages of Don with wildlife pictures on it, m the profit from that product goes to saving more wildlife. And so I'll show you that story. I got troubles of the not today, cause they're gonna wash away, they're gonna wash away. And this program from Pampers, recognizing that if a baby gets a good night's sleep, he's able to develop effectively. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. bright. It's not about the diaper and how much containment it does. It's about letting the child have a good night's sleep. And that insight and that understanding about a good night's sleep for mother and baby has really been the key for developing markets to understand how disposable diapers can fit into their life and to make a positive difference in the development of their children. So that, that's been a successful program that is in China called Pampers Golden Sleep, where they do a lot to educate about getting a good night's sleep. Um, we also have a program with UNICEF, which has been very successful. Um, basically, if you buy a pack of Pampers in a developed world, it actually funds a free vaccination for children in, um, in developing countries. And uh, I'll show that one real fast. This is, um, it's Selma Hyatt is the um, spokesperson for this. And so you may have seen some of the commercials. This is a, a recent one. Dream is a hard world out there. See, and in 
When you buy specially marked Pampers, you can help the world's babies in need. Because one pack of Pampers equals one life-saving vaccine. Together, we can help give babies a brighter tomorrow. And mothers care about other mothers and other babies. I mean, babies are universal, and mother-baby relationship is, is universal. And, and mothers in the United States want to give, and in Europe, want to give for the benefit of others around the world. So it's a very successful program in terms of uh, doing good and having empathy for mothers and children, but also empowering them to do something, giving them the ability to take action. So I think it's powerful. Um, another program that they have is the empathy as they got into this and really thinking about baby development is that a parent is born and there's nothing done for parents to train them or prepare them or get them ready to parent. So they've created a website um, and videos that talk about becoming a parent, which has been um, really connecting emotionally with parents um, and, and creating a bond with Pampers that, that's powerful. So it goes back, that's a service, you know, we say branded products and services for a higher purpose. But you don't get there if you don't first care about the other person. So you have to unleash empathy if you're going to start to get to some of this stuff. But that's what's happening at P&G right now. And I would say P Pampers has been on the journey the longest. And so they actually had the best um, kind of head start, if you will, because very early on they understood, uh, in the last decade, they understood that it's about baby development and creating that healthy baby. Um, other brands are now awakening to this, and so it's, um, it's growing all around. Um, all the businesses right now are working on what is our real purpose here, which is exciting, and all tying and cascading off of touching lives, improving life. Um, so that's some of the impact of, uh, of um, kind of unleashing empathy in the business. So a lot of exciting stuff is going on. Um, but it's not a lot of people that are doing the design thinking portion of it. In fact, it's less than two people. It's a third of me. It's a guy that works for me and um, a portion of my administrator who administers the network. So from a dedicated resources standpoint, we're making a change in a 140,000 person organization with very few resources because I actually don't think a controlled central control and command approach would work for this because it's about making a difference and having meaning in your life and feeling like you're doing something that's worthy. And so it's more out of personal passion that people engage in design thinking than it is about some project on your project list. So we took an open source model approach to it. How many people have read The Starfish and the Spider? It's an organizational design book, just a couple. So if you're a spider, if you cut the head off, it's dead. But if you're a starfish and you cut the head off, first of all, where's the head? If you cut off a leg, it, it grows back another leg or another starfish grows. So we went after the starfish model of design thinking, which is we're going to nurture it, we're going to support it, but we're going to have it grow and extend itself versus us trying to control it, which is a very different experience, uh, experience in P&G and one that got a lot of, in the beginning, a lot of... Uh, you know, concern because are you going to control the quality? How do you know you're going to make sure what's going on? You know, we had a, a business leader, the head of North America wants us to help her with a session and it's supposed to happen in a couple of weeks and she wanted to do a design thinking session to help her before a strategy review with, with Bob McDonald, our new CEO. And I said, love to do it. Um, but it's a volunteer, she goes, can't you just put someone on it? And I'm like, no, I'm in Asia and it's a volunteer network and everyone's busy. So can you imagine telling group president, sorry, everyone's busy. But I said, it's a volunteer network. People like this idea. It's a cool thing they want to work on, but you'll have to shift the date till they're available, until someone's available. So she shifted it. She shifted it back and made it the two days before her strategy review because she felt that strongly it needed to happen beforehand so she could look at alternatives before she took them forward. So I thought that was pretty cool. But to have to tell someone, you know, they're like, can't you just redeploy your resources this way? Well, 
there's less than two resources globally on this, so um, no, <laughs> I can't redeploy them because they're deployed. But um, so we have a volunteer um, army, as I call it. We have 180 people trained to help others in the processing of this. And the first 30 were trained by Stanford, but the remaining 150 have been trained by uh, me and um, about uh, 10 people around the globe that are passionate about volunteering to train others. So that's exciting. Um, we've had thousands experience at all functions, all regions. And we don't care what your background is to be in it, just personal passion and desire to learn. And so we have secretaries in the company that are trained in design thinking who are phenomenal facilitators. And we have vice presidents who are trained who are phenomenal facilitators. So it's more about, it's not a hierarchical thing. It's more a personal passion and a willingness to, to put yourself at risk um, to push people to work in a different way. Um, and we have a pay it forward mentality. Let me explain that. How many people have seen the movie Pay It Forward? A lot of people. Basically, the notion is do something good for three people for no reason at all with no expectation of payback and let, encourage them to do it for three others. And very quickly, the numbers get big. So when we trained the first 32 people, I paid for their training, which was expensive. But I felt strongly I needed to remove barriers for that personal passion of this un unproven thing. And um, my only request is that they had to help three other people on a design thinking session that wasn't related to their business. They all did it. They all did it. It was amazing. And then people started doing it. And people help each other all the time. It's just an amazing thing. You know, There's just a desire. And it's not on a lot of work plans, um, but it is in their hearts. And so people make time for it. So we have a pay it forward mentality. And what's interesting, and here's the funny thing, is in the beginning, people are like, you're distracting my organization. You're taking my people off the business. OK, so all the things you might expect. Now it's like, I got the job because I'm in the design thinking network. I applied for this job over here in another part of the company. And they hired me over the other candidates because I'm in the design thinking network. And they wanted design thinking embedded on their business. So the shift in the last couple of years has been just amazing, just amazing. Um, I'm going to give you quickly the really reallys of design thinking at P&G. Um, I believe in squeeze the middle change management, which is my answer to every change I've ever led at P&G, which is inspire and set the vision with top management and empower the masses. The people with the most resistance to change are the people in the middle management, people like me at the director level who are in charge of making sure everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. So you need to, you need to get their bosses asking the right question and their people able to answer. And then they come along. So I believe in that philosophy. And it, it's definitely what we did in design thinking. Um, I believe you have to go after some high risk, high return, uh, visible wins, audacious, wicked problems. Um, the very first session we facilitated after we got trained in how to work this way ourselves was the CEO session. Um, and no one had ever, they got trained it in May, at the end of May and the 1st of June with the Stanford team. And the 1st of July, uh, the end of July, we, did a, we facilitated our CEO and his leadership team ourselves for the first time, never having done it before. And um, it was scary, but it was great. And um, we also, so we did a couple of these high visibility things where there were high stakes, but why not? I mean, that's what design thinking is about, is, is putting yourself out there and being fully present. And we were fully present for that session, um, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, borrow external credibility initially. Um, Stanford. Uh, we have an internal thing called Clay Street, which has facilitators that are considered to be top gun. Um, we, we used those folks to help us get started, and we, and we talked about a lot that we were working with them. Um, we partnered stakeholders and naysayers. There were a lot of people, I was talking earlier about this, there were a lot of people in design who were uncomfortable with design thinking being coming a, a multidisciplinary activity. They, they felt threatened a little bit. Um, but I invited them in. We encouraged them to come along. We encouraged them to come to sessions, to get trained, to, to try it with their business partners. Um, and so anytime someone has resisted, we've opened the doors and said, well, come take a look and, and see what you think. Um, and then the network, um, I have to say, when you do your first session as a newly trained network with the CEO and his leadership team, the survival of that creates an incredible bond <laughs> that is just, you know, that is amazing. Um, to operationalize, you need the business leaders um, to support you. Um, and not just the business leader at the top, but when you go to then do sessions with other businesses, you actually need the business leader bought in. Um, we used external benchmarking to help us stay true to what opportunities were there. And we integrated um, 
as much as possible what we were doing with existing processes with P&G. That's been critical to connecting with the early majority. If it sits too long outside the system, you get into problems, so moving it into the system. Um, we are trying to shift design thinking beyond a method that's used to solve problems into a mindset and, frankly, a culture. And so we've got some culture initiatives that are under pilot right now, which we're very excited about. Um, and we're trying to move out of fad into something that's enduring at P&G that really becomes part of our way of doing things, just like innovation is our lifeblood, design thinking being part of our lifeblood. Um, and how do we make it something that's enduring and not lose the passion of the network? Um, and then another challenge, because these are all volunteers that are doing this, a lot of times they don't have, um, they're not in the business, so they aren't there to see it through. So ensuring actionability and setting up the conditions, making sure the sponsor has appointed a team that will take the actions forward. We learned that the hard way. We didn't have that built into our early sessions, and then it's like, well, whose job is it anyway? Um, so now we build that up front, and that's helping a lot. Um, finally, this was AG's belief, and I think he has seen that and believes it's been a part of the results that he's delivered at P&G, that great design tilts the playing field. It creates breakthroughs that define markets, drive profits, and inspire culture. And that was his belief early on. Even though he didn't know fully what he was believing, he believed it, and he moved in that direction. And I'm a big believer when you're leading change of the flashlight theory, which you know generally where you're going to go. You point the flashlight, and you step into the light, and the next step is clear. And that's how we've gone about it at P&G. And the way it'll be practiced you know, two, three, four years from now versus today will be dramatically different. But we will have moved in the right direction and over time gotten better clarity about how to move and evolve. So that is kind of P&G design thinking. And I'm open to questions. I know we have a half hour left for anything you want to talk. So.